All righty, we're gonna go ahead and start. We got one person bringing a chair in. Again, uh, courtesy of Smoke Show Barbecue, which featured on the Food Channel, Enjoy, Take Plenty Home. And the foods that you're eating are the uh, foods that were most popularly selected by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So he is living through food in you today. So that's a good thing. Uh, so welcome to the second annual I Am The Dream past, present, and future award ceremony. For those of you that I have not had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Dr. Lisa McBride, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and what we call in our office the Big B, belonging. That belonging is uh, central to our school's mission, our mission for as we strive for inclusive excellence. I'm excited tomorrow that uh, Lenore Perlstein is here from Insight into Diversity. The president, hey Lenore, she will be awarding the Geisel School of Medicine the 2023 Higher Education Excellence in Diversity Award. I know I don't get a clap for that, right? <laughs> that is our award for everyone in this room because inclusive excellence means that in order for us to be inclusive, we have to be excellent. Excellence in medical education, excellence in delivery of clinical care, excellent in research and scholarship, and all of those things require us to mail inclusiveness with excellence. So thank you, Lenore, for being here. So our awardees today, uh, today embody or exemplify uh, not only excellence, but they embody the ideas and values of courage, humility, dignity, and service, which were uh, radiant in defining the character of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and in his empowered leadership. And so today, we have a great opportunity as a collective group to first recognize the past. And when I say the past, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Dr. Samuel Ford McGill from the alumnus from the class of 1839. Did you hear what I just said, 1839? He was the first person of African descent to graduate from a US <coughs> medical school. That is our Dartmouth College striving for excellence. So we will acknowledge him today and as a, a awardee, we'll get an award in his honor. And on February the 9th, if you see in your program, we're gonna have a birthday party for Dr. Samuel Ford McGill, and we're so excited. Come out and join us. Today we will also salute our present, what I like to thank Dr. Ross Lee for giving me last night as a nugget, as our change agents, our agents of change for service. It was someone by the name of Shirley Chisholm, who was the first black woman to be elected to Congress, who said that service is the rent that we, we that we pay for the privilege of living on this earth. Service is what our awardees have dedicated their life to, and I wanna thank them uh, for their service. But it was also Dr. Martin Luther King who said, we are not makers of history, we are made by history. And so let that sink in because you are the future of the making of history as what Dr. Martin Luther King brought up because when we recognize uh, today is the national federal holiday for the National Day of Service for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It also, in honor of his legacy, uh, we are going to really cherish this day as we're gonna honor his commitment to justice and for anti-poverty work. And so when I say we are made by history, you are the future for us. As we uh, acknowledge that in his final chapter, in his final book, before he was brutally assassinated, he made a proclamation and he set out a vision in his book for a roadmap of how we could address and eliminate hunger and poverty. And so he started what's called the, People's, the Poor People's Campaign. And that campaign, I wish he would have been able to see it. 
and I told uh, our nominating committee that it brought tears to my eyes, and I'm sure to you, to know that we as a society of 37 million Americans are still suffering from food insecurity and poverty. And as a community, we are going to have a 42-day challenge to honor the memory of those in May of 1968, after he was assassinated, his lovely wife, Coretta Scott King, who said a woman is not the leader of the family. No, I didn't go there, but you. <laughs> but she led thousands to occupy the National Mall in DC. And they sat there for 42 days in 3,000 tents in what they call Restoration City. And policies came from that, but we're still in the position that we are today. So as a community of anti-hunger advocates with similar ambitions towards change, structural change, we know that food insecurity is associated with numerous health disparities and poor health outcomes. In fact, 7.2% uh, of individuals in New Hampshire live below poverty. And when a survey was conducted by the Guilford Community Health Needs Assessment, when respondents were asked what factors were most important for a healthy community, what did they say? Access to healthy food. So for the next 42 days, we're going to challenge the Geisel and Dartmouth Health community to be involved in several things. We're going to be offering, thanks to you registering, thanks for RSVPing, because you're gonna get an opportunity to attend all of these uh, events. But we'll start first with the exp uh, experiential learning opportunities, providing food security education. We then are challenging ourselves to upgrade our food pantries, not only on our campus, but also in the communities that we serve and, and upgrade them to a food pharmacy is our goal. We're gonna work with uh, various local organizations to distribute boxes of food, and produce, and we're also gonna prepackage lunches for school-aged children and provide medically tailored uh, uh, culinary workshops, particularly for rural cancer patients, is our goal. So today is the start of our 42-day challenge, as we will be able to host from two to five, we still have some seats available, we will be hosting a month in a life which is our uh, Missouri Community Action Poverty Simulation that was developed in 2015. And so that is an interactive, immersive experience uh, where participants unpack elements of tr uh, trauma-informed care and use that application when serving those who are living families or individuals experiencing poverty. So you still have an opportunity to experience this. That will be led later with our book series. We'll be doing the Matthew Desmond series on the poverty by America. All our participants will get that and also evicted. And so we are going to continue the conversation because we know this is a heavy lift. And to honor Dr. Martin Luther King, we owe it to ourselves to meet the challenge. And so, it, the next voice that you hear won't be mine. I'm gonna sit down and maybe get some of that barbecue, possibly. But the next voice you hear will be from our uh, mistress of ceremony, as well as our keynote address by the legendary, the trailblazer, Dr. Barbara Ross Lee, someone who I've admired for many years uh, when I met her in 2009. So I met her when I was 14. <laughs> There you go, you're 15. <laughs> so Dr. Elise Rosely Acre is a assistant professor at John Hopkins University in the Bloomsburg School of Public Health in the Department of Health Policy and Management. She is in her own right a legendary person because she kept her word. I asked her a year ago, would you come back and be the MC? And she said, I got you doc, I got you. And so an interdisciplinary health services researcher and health equity scholar who uh, measures and understands and measures structural racism, sexism, heterosexism in healthcare and health systems. Uh, through her scholarship, uh, she leverages intersexuality, Kimberly Cronshaw's conceptual framework 
to quantify studies of how social, demographic, and policy context shape health and health care disparities in the BIPOC community, black people, uh, black people and people of color and the LGBTQIA plus in older adults, which is where her research has landed recently as she has cur is currently being funded by the NIH National Institute of Aging. Uh, although she is at John Hopkins, she is still an adjunct professor at the Dartmouth Institute, okay? Uh, she did her postdoctoral training at the Department of Medicine at Vanderbilt where she studied LGBT health disparity and aging. Numerous awards, but the one that I am most proud of is the Dartmouth College E.E. Just Faculty Fellowship Award, which is awarded from the provost at Dartmouth to support STEM research by early career tenure track faculty of color, and that was awarded in 2022. And so, Dr. Acre, this is your world. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Dr. McBride, for that wonderful introduction. It is a uh, pleasure to be here, pleasure to be back in the Upper Valley. Um, I know the weather has been a little bit tricky, so it's um, wonderful to see you all. I'm glad that things cleared up and everyone was able to travel here safely. I'm going to uh, start this event by announcing the winners of the various awards today. We're gonna start with, apologies, Dr. McBride, I'm about almost six feet tall, I gotta bring that up. <laughs> So the first award is going to be to the Community Champion Award to Alicia Robinson. Alicia is often described as the person who gets things done and shows up. Alicia loves being an inclusion conspirator, community builder. She identifies as a mixed race and a mixed race person and uses she her pronouns. Alicia currently works at Alice Peck Day Memorial Hospital as a human resource business partner and diversity, equity and inclusion program coordinator. In addition to her role at APD, Alicia serves as the chair of the Dartmouth Health Black Indigenous Health Black Indigenous People of Color Employee Resource Group. She's the chair of the New Hampshire Hospital Association Hospital Systems Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Peer Learning Group Committee. She's a part of the Vital Communities Advisory Board. She's an Emerging Leader Fellow, a City of Lebanon DEI Commission member and she was a newly appointed board member at the Public Health Council of the Upper Valley. And this organization, like Dr. King's Poor People's Campaign, focuses on creating opportunity for persons in the Upper Valley to earn a livable wage, reside in safe housing, and access health equity and affordable, and affordable food. Serving in these various roles, Alicia had made connections to civil rights and social organizations in the community, uplifting voices in the Upper Valley who are seeking allyship in gender and racial struggles. She also has three adult children and a five-year-old grandson. She enjoys reading, walking, and sunshine. And when we talk about embodying excellence, when we talk about showing up for people, when I tell you the first time I met Alicia, in 10 minutes she had my bone marrow, I was signed up to be a donator and a going to an event and joining a board. I would, <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Alicia Robinson to accept the Community Champion Award. Thank you, everyone. Wow, there's a lot of you. Um, I was a little worried after Dr. McBride was rattling off quotes. I thought she was going to steal mine. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to start, of course, with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, which he said once that everybody can be great because anybody can serve. And as Dr. McBride was talking about service, I just thank you so much. Um, and my anonymous um, nominator, I hope you're out there and will someday tell me who you are, um, but I appreciate you. And um, I just, I, I am so blessed to work in a community um, that allows me to be great. So thank you so much.
The next award is going to be the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Award. And this award goes to Dr. Charles R. Thomas. Dr. Thomas is a professor and chief of radiation oncology at Dartmouth Geisel School of Medicine and Dartmouth Cancer Center, where he joined faculty in fall of 2021. Previously, he served as a professor and chair of the Department of Radiation Medicine at Knight Cancer Institute, Oregon Health and Science University School of Medicine at OHSU Healthcare. He recently served as a mentor for American Society of Clinical Oncology Summer Internship Program and on the faculty of the 2022 ASCO Annual Meeting. Among his scholarly and research interests are protocol development of translational research based national cooperative group combined modality therapeutic clinical trials for GI and, thor and thoracic solid tumors. That is a mouthful and quite important. <laughs> It's, and additionally, it's development of strategies to address barriers to participation in cancer clinical trials amongst minority and ethnic populations in the U.S., as well as the development of pipeline strategies to increase underrepresented investigators in radiologic sciences and, career, and cancer medicine. Additionally, there's patient-provided communication work, as well as studying burnout assessment and management in academic leaders, and finally, cancer emergency medicine. Dr. Thomas earned a medical degree from the University of Illinois College of Medicine, and completed residencies at Baylor College of Medicine in Texas for internal medicine, as well as the University of Washington School of Medicine for radiation oncology. He also trained through fellowships in medical oncology at Rush St. Luke's Presbyterian Hospital in Chicago and in radiation oncology at the University of Washington. And when we talk about legacy, when we talk about what we leave behind, how we contribute, his experiences in, in, in work around mentorship his uh, being so open to guide and help students, underrepresented early stage researcher, is just so palpable and so readily available that in my short time at Dartmouth, he was able to touch my experience as well. So I'd like to ask you all to help me bring up our Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Award winner, Dr. Charles Thomas. Thank you all very much. I appreciate this acknowledgement. It's been a long journey. I remember back in 1975, just um, whatever, seven years after Dr. King opened the doors following his and uh, Bobby Kennedy's assassination, where my parents drove me up here to start as a freshman. And then that's my lovely wife, Muriel. We brought our kids up here um, as undergrads also. And so there's a lot of work to be done. These are challenging times. One needs to be vigilant. And um, I'm very proud to even be considered in the same sentence as uh, Dr. King. On behalf of my entire department, Department of Radiation Oncology and Applied Sciences, uh, Dr. McBride and the whole team, thank you very much. Um, Muriel and I have a lot of uh, work to do to continue this journey, and we're excited. Thank you again, Dr. Thomas. Our next award is gonna go to the Distinguished Alumni Award. Dr. Gerald Onuaha, Onuoha, my apologies. Dr. Gerald Onuoha is an internal medicine hospitalist at HCA Healthcare and Vision and a cultural curator who bridges multiple platforms to bring communities together to uplift and support equality and equity for all people. Dr. Onuoha dropped out of high school but then returned and went on to graduate from Tennessee, uh, Tennessee State University with a degree in physics in 2008. He earned his Doctor of Medicine at Meharry Medical College in 2014 and earned his Master's of Science from the Dartmouth Institute at Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth in 2015. Dr. Onoha is a leading expert in health equity and was named one of the top 10 doctors under 40 by National Medical Association. Growing up in poverty in a single parent home, he never thought his life would turn out as it has. Since his matriculation through school, he has worked to find solutions to the problems that he has seen in his community. These issues that prevent the dream from being realized and choke the root of so many with potential. 
Realizing the lack of black doctors, he started the Project Dream Community Initiative, an organization designed to help underprivileged and underserved students matriculate from high school to college and on to medical, dental, and graduate school. In addition, at Nashville General Hospital, Dr. Anwoha created a program to help patients who could not pay for their medications get them for free. He also created Everybody vs. Racism, or EVR, an organization whose mission is to eradicate racism and discrimination of, ever, of any kind. He formed EVR in 2020 as a response to the killing of George Floyd. And at the time, he was one of the only black doctors at his hospital, and racial tensions were very high. He created EVR to bring everybody together through education, understanding, and action. So everybody, please put your hands together for our Distinguished Alumni Award winner. Hey, Garvin. Un unfortunately, he was not so able to be here, but he's provided a message for you all. Hey, Darvin. Thank you so much for choosing me for the Martin Luther King Distinguished Alumni Award. When I think about the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, I reflect on the philosophy that he took with him throughout his journey. He believed that all men and women were created equal. He believed that no one should be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He also believed that unity was much better than separation. And although we've made many strides in the right direction, there's still a lot of work to do. Systemic racism is a pandemic that can only be cured together. And it's not enough just to think about the problems or build groups to talk about the problems, but we have to take action and we have to do it with love, grace, and a lot of patience. Because it's not black versus white, but it's everybody versus racism. I wish I was there to celebrate with you all. I'm sorry I couldn't make it. I will try to be at the next one. But thank <laughs> you so much for this award. I really appreciate it. So our next award is going to be the Outstanding Faculty Award, and this goes to Dr. Manish Mishra. Dr. Mishra is a lecturer, the Interim Director of Student Affairs for the MPH program, and the Inaugural Director of the Learning Environment Office at the Geisel School of Medicine. He also serves as the Director of Professional Education at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. This role has led to the creation of the nationally acclaimed Dartmouth Healthcare Foundation Initiative that links the study of arts and humanities into pre-health education for undergraduate students. Dr. Mishra's research includes the development of shared decision-making tools, the creation of novel patient communication platforms in medical education, studying the role of accountable care organization models in healthcare reform, and working on system redesign in global mental health care. He is a course director in a variety of courses offered at the medical school, public health institute, and Dartmouth College, and leads several human rights initiatives with students. He earned his MD from Dartmouth Medical School in 2005 and an MPH from the Dartmouth Institute in 2009. He served as a resident physician in the Department of Surgery, Department of Preventive Medicine, and Department of Psychiatry, all at the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. He has completed fellowship training in geriatric psychology and addiction psychiatry. Prior to medical school, he studied Sankrit and religion in the Department of Sankrit and Indian Studies at Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Manish Mishra, our outstanding faculty member. Wow, uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is a big deal. <laughs> um, to take a moment and pause to think about the effect and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. This is a big deal. The celebration's a big deal. Thank you, Dr. McBride. Um, I think I'm here because of the work of advocacy, and nobody does advocacy work by themselves. And um, I'm just looking at my table. I'm looking at this room. Um, you know, if. Uh, if a compass relies on understanding gravity in true north, I think my, my wife meets criteria. Um, 
I have an amazing supervisor in Dr. Craig Wessling who creates space and allows people, allows his faculty to sing their best songs. I think that's at best in advocacy, that's what we're able to do. I'm looking at Elizabeth and Lisa, my partners in this advocacy work uh, that we're trying to create a new science and medicine with. How do we care for ourselves as we start to do the work? Um, <coughs> there's, a, uh, there's a second year resident at UCLA who uh, is trying to join by live stream right now. Hopefully he's not on rounds and is able to join. Dr. Fred Burton, um, he graduated from Dartmouth two years ago. And when he was a medical student, racism showed up at his front door in a really grotesque way. And we had a really deep conversation. And at the end of it, I asked him, hey man, what do you wanna do? And he said, uh, let's get back to work. I learned more about social justice that day than I could ever reading any other book. So Fred, if you're there, thank you for teaching me so much. And it's a privilege to be here with everybody, so thanks. And so the next award is gonna be our Outstanding uh, Staff Award, and this goes to Megan Reed. Megan Reed is the director of the hybrid MPH program at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College. She has over 10 years of experience working with adult learners in both the healthcare and higher education environments, including curriculum design and instruction, program management and evaluation, and continuous improvement activities. While working full time, she completed her master's in public health degree at the University of New Hampshire in 2014. She transitioned into an infection prevention position in the Quality Assurance and Safety Department at DHMC. After many years at DHMC, she decided to follow her passion for working with adult learners and transitioned to working in higher education at Dartmouth College in 2019. As the director of the hybrid MPH program and oversees, she oversees the hybrid MPH program planning, development, implementation, evaluation, and improvement activities. She has the pleasure of working with students throughout the entire learning experience in the program. Megan enjoys working on multidisciplinary teams, problem solving, and improving outcomes. She values a positive, inclusive team environment where all voices are heard and respected. She takes these core values into the classroom where one of her top priority, priorities is to cultivate a positive, supportive, and inclusive learning environment. She strives to create a safe environment based on mutual respect and open-mindedness where all students can achieve academic success. And I will say that after working with Megan and working with students in the program, everything that is written here rings true. She's been an amazing resource, an amazing support, and has allowed me to, to help different students get engaged in varieties of research. And she has a great way of bringing us all together and meeting people's needs and so that every, all people can be successful. And that is one of the true foundations of equity. So please, let's um, put our hands together for our Outstanding Staff Award winner, Megan Reed. And unfortunately, Megan is not here to join us today, but we will have Craig Wessling go ahead and give uh, accept her award on her behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Megan sends her regret. She's uh, home taking care of her family today. She just wanted to let you know that she's humbled and grateful for this award. Thank you. Now our next award is the Student of Merit Award, and that goes to Omar Sajad. Omar is originally from Pleasanton, California, whoop whoop for California, <laughs> and he graduated from the University of California, San Diego with a BA in Global Health and a BS in General Biology. He later received his MS in Global Health from the University of California, San Francisco, where his, his thesis identified novel risk factors for malaria diagnosis among migrant workers in Vietnam. Before matriculating at Geisel, Omar worked at the World Health Organization in Bangkok and served as a research fellow at the California Department of Public Health. He also has extensive experience mentoring individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. In his spare time as a medical student, 
spare time as a medical student. <laughs> he co-founded a health education and enrichment program for local adults with disabilities, resulting in regular activities such as cooking classes, gardening, hikes, and arts and crafts for participants. At Geisel, Omar has founded the Muslim Medical Ed Student Association and the History of Medicine Society, in addition to co-leading the Internal Medicine Interest Group. He plans on applying into a primary care specialty where he hopes to treat patients of all abilities and backgrounds. So when we talk about excellence, when we talk about excellence in our students, Omar is a wonderful example. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Omar Sajjad to receive his award. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. McBride and the members of the DICE office at Geisel for this tremendous honor. In the span of just over one year, they've already done so much work in fostering a sense of inclusion and belonging among the student body here. I'd like to dedicate this award to my parents and my older brother who are watching via live stream. Um, from a very young age, they gave me a very firm sense of what is right and what is wrong. And gave me the courage to really stand up for my convictions, including my work in the disability advocacy space. So this is for them. Thank you. Our next award is the Student of Merit Award. This award goes to Christina Ali. Christina is a fourth year student from the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan. During her time at Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, Christina has been extremely engaged and active with various groups and with student government. Christina served as the co-chair of social life on the Geisel student government from 2020 to 2023. She served as the treasurer for the Geisel chapter of the Student National Medical Association for the 2020 and 2021 academic year where she secured funding for membership fees, regional and national conferences, and community building events. She also started a program with other Geisel affinity groups for matriculating students to connect with current underrepresented and medicine students. She co-founded the inaugural Geisel SNMA Black History Month celebration in 2021, which featured speakers, panels, and community building events. She was integral in the successful advocating for the Samuel Ford McGill Lounge in the 2022 and 2023 academic year as a member of the Black, student, at Black Students at Geisel. In 2023, she led the social media campaign for the Geisel SNMA Black History Month celebration, which featured posts about Black history and culture, as well as highlighting students and alumni. She is the current student body, president, student body president for the 2023 and 2024 academic year, where she represents all medical students with focus on increasing students' voice and issues impa impacting the student body, including grading policies, curriculum, and improvements to diversity, equity, and inclusion in education at Geisel. Christina graduated from Princeton University in 2014 and earned a master's in biochemistry from Georgetown University in 2018. Prior to Geisel, she worked at, the, at a nonprofit in Chicago doing grant writing and fundraising and a biotech startup in Washington, D.C. doing operations and sales. When we talk about excellence, when we talk about advancing and up and uplifting voices and being an active participant in our liberation, Christina is a wonderful example of that. So th I want you all to help me welcome our Student of Merit Award winner, Christina Ali. Oh, hi everyone. Um, so first I have to say thank you to the DICE office, Dr. McBride, um, echoing what Omar said, um, all the work you guys do, we all really appreciate it. Um, my proudest role here that I've had is being the student body president. Um, and so I have to say something about all of our students here. Um, I am merely the president of our student body and they're the ones that do all the work. And I'm very proud to say that we've created so many opportunities for them to increase equity and belonging in our education, how we interact with each other, and I'm just so proud of all of our students and thank everyone in this room for joining them in that work. All right, 
Last but surely not least, we have our Samuel Ford McGill Award. And this award goes to Irene Donkwa Mullen. Dr. Irene Donkwa Mullen is a physician thought leader and scientist with diverse local regional, local, regional, and national leadership experience working in primary care, public health, and health equity and community. She is currently the Chief Health, Office, Chief Health Officer at Marty Health, a health equity startup company that promotes comprehensive quality care and case management coordination targeting underserved and socially disadvantaged communities. She is also an adjunct professor at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. Dr. Donkwa Mullen was formerly Chief Health Equity Officer at IBM Watson Health. She also served as Deputy Chief Health Officer, Lead Scientific Officer for Data and Evidence. Her work at IBM received recognition and she was appointed to the IBM Industry Academy of Distinguished Leaders to work collaboratively with other industry leaders on creative and cutting edge technology innovations. Dr. Donkwa Mullen has maintained keen passion for patient-centered care, promoting equitable health outcomes and patient experience while identifying opportunities to create more inclusive, culturally competent, equitable, and compassionate clinical care services. Dr. Donkwa Mullen completed undergraduate studies in biochemistry and chemistry at Barnard College in New York City. She received her Master's of Public Health degree from Yale School of Public Health and her MD degree from the Dartmouth Geisel School of Medicine. She completed her residency and training in internal medicine at the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland. She enjoys mentoring, gardening, and cooking. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Irene Donkwa Mullen, the winner of our Samuel Ford McGill Award. here because I'm filled with so much emotions and so much gratitude um, for this award. And I would say that um, th this recognition is not just um, a personal achievement for me, but it's a true testament to the commitment of, uh, it's actually a col collective dedication of um, my family who have come here to support me. Um, on this table, my siblings, my brother-in-law, my niece, Alexa, thank you so much. Um, it's also a collective dedication and support of the Geisel family where I started my medical degree and the faculty, my mentors, my mentees as well, um, and the extended community of health disparities researchers and advocates um, who inspire me every day. Um, and keep inspiring me to do what I do. Um, I always say that I am who I am because of a social mission. I'm who I am because of someone who was dedicated to social mission and service to others. And so I have it in me to always be of service to others, be a servant leader, um, and help be a change agent. Um, I also want to mention that this is so special um, because of a special connection to Dr. Barbara Ross Lee through my husband who passed on a couple of years ago. Um, doc, my husband had written, was so enamored by Dr. Ross Lee that he wrote a book on profiles in primary care, um, profiling champions of primary care and featured Dr. Barbara Ross Lee. So thank you for inspiring him, because he's also one of my inspiration. So um, I do want to say that to be acknowledged with this award is really um, an immense honor. And um, I also, I'm really proud because Dr. Ford McGill was a freed African-American slave. Um, we all know that he, was from Maryland, and he was the first African-American to earn a medical degree. But it's also an African legacy, as much as it is an African-American legacy, because he returned back to Liberia as one of the very few pioneers in medicine and helped to train other African doctors in the continent, one of the very few. So we cherish him on the continent of Africa. 
And I was born and raised in Ghana, and so he was one of my heroes. So this award really means so much to me, and I'm humbled to be associated with this award, um, a mission that especially uh, is focused on ensuring health care, quality health care for um, communities that have been underserved, black and brown communities, and especially in Africa as well. So um, I also want to say that this is also a reflection of Geisel's commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion and belonging. Um, and it's evidence in the pursuit of commitment to inclusive excellence that the DICE program has fostered. And so thank you to Dr. Lisa McBride, your team, uh, for really spearheading all the efforts and initiative. Uh, we're really proud of that. So I want to say that as we celebrate Martin Luther King's legacy today, we, remember, we should remember that the path to true, true leadership is about making change, it's about service to others. Um, it basically uh, has an effect, an, Im an impact uh, for very long in, in underserved communities. So I'm accepting this award with immense gratitude um, and I hope to continue in my work and carry it forward um, with the support of all of you. Thank you so much. In Martin Luther King Jr.'s last book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos, Our Community, he talks about the beloved community. It's a central theme of this book. It's about a society based on justice, equality, and love. And so when I think about all of the accomplishments, the wonderful service that all of our award winners have done today, I'd like to thank you all for your service, your commitment, and your excellence. Let's have one final round of applause for all of our award winners. that, we're going to move on to uh, introducing our keynote speaker for the day. As we, as we said, the wonderful, the illustrious, the legendary Dr. Barbara Ross Lee. <laughs> I, uh, just saying. So Dr. Barbara Ross Lee served as Vice President for Health Sciences and Medical Affairs at the New York Institute of Technology from 2001 until 2017. Additionally, during that time, she served as the Interim Dean of College of Osteopathic Medicine and Interim Dean of the School of Health Professions. In November 2014, Dr. Rossley became the inaugural dean for the second campus of the New York Institute of Technology's College of Osteopathic Medicine, located in Arkansas, where she also served as its CEO of its academic health centers, and she was the president of the faculty practice plan all while continuing service as Vice President for Health Sciences and Medical Affairs. So I don't know what, what, if you, what twin you had, what clone you had, <laughs> but all of those roles, absolutely amazing. Dr. Ross Lee is a nationally recognized expert on health policy issues and serves as an advisor of primary care, medical education, minority health, women's health, and rural health care issues on the federal and state levels. She is the founding director of the American Osteopathic Association's Health Policy Fellowship Program, which prepares mid-career osteopathic physicians for leadership roles in healthcare. Dr. Ross Lee is also the founding director of the Training and Policy Studies, or TIPS, for osteopathic resident physicians. Between 1993 and 2001, Dr. Ross Lee served as the dean of Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine, making her the first African-American woman to serve as a dean in a United States medical school. Can we just get a round of applause for that? In another first, she was also the first osteopathic physician to participate in, re in research in the Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellowship. 
Dr. Ross Lee served as a commission, um, commissioned officer in the United States Naval Reserve Medical Corps, achieving the rank of captain. She lectures both nationally and internationally and has published numerous scholarly articles on a variety of medical and healthcare issues. She is the recipient of nine honorary degrees and many national awards. Most recently, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education named their annual Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Award the Dr. Barbara Ross Lee Doc Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Award in her honor. So another round of applause. Dr. Ross Lee has served as the chair of the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine Council of Presidents. She's been the chair of the American Osteopathic Association Council on Pre-Doctoral Education and the chair of the board of the Association of Academic Health Centers. In 1993, Dr. Ross Lee was appointed by the Institute of Medicine as a member of the Planning Committee on the Future of Primary Care, and in 2012, she was appointed by the Institute of Medicine to serve as a member of the, cons of the Consensus Committee on Governance and Financing of Graduate Medical Education, which is responsible for recommending reforms to the graduate medical education system. Dr. Ross Lee assumed the position of President of the American Osteopathic Foundation in January 2022 and served as the immediate past president as well. She also taught me how to say osteopathic. <laughs> so without further ado, will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Barbara Ross Lee to the stage. Let's practice. Osteopathic. Oh, okay. Come on, come on, come on. Osteopathic. Osteopathic. I want you to know I won't allow my family to even try that in public. <laughs> so thank you. You got it. Oh, this is really, really great. Well, greetings. Uh, greetings to Giselle Medical School at Dartmouth. I'm honored to be with you today as the nation acknowledges somebody really important, Dar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And what an amazing program we've had in his honor. I'd like to congratulate each of the award recipients. They deserve it. I would like to congr congratulate all of you. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> It's all, always especially rewarding to be uh, recognized by people that you work with or students that you are engaged with. So these are special awards. It would help if I stood in front of the microphone. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, as I congratulate, congratulate this year's award recipients, I think we should also congratulate last year's award recipients because this is going to be an annual process. And for the recipients this year, you need to know you raise the bar for next year. Got it? Okay. We are all very proud of you. I would be remiss if I didn't extend a special thank you to Dr. Lisa McBride and her team for inviting me to participate. This awards program provides an opportunity for us to become informed about the progress, progress that is being made to address societal inequalities that produce health inequities and health disparities. By showcasing what can be done and what is being done by the award recipients and members of the Dartmouth Giselle community, we honor, we honor Dr. King's le legacy. I applaud the planning and commitment of the college to not just passively address this as a history day, but by recognizing Martin Luther King Day for what it is, a 
a statement of progress for the future. It's not just a day off from work. This is an important day for all of us, for our futures. We want to use this day as an opportunity to actively remind us, especially in medicine and medical education, of our obligation to assist the house of medicine to achieve medical equality as a moral imperative. The health inequities that we experience today are a direct consequence of the inhumane social inequalities that continue to exist in the form of explicit bias, systemic bias, structural bias, and implicit bias. We sometimes try and capture those in the box that we call the social determinants of health. But they're deeper and more targeted than just social determinants of health. Annual programming such as this keeps us informed about what's being accomplished, what's being accomplished, what needs to be accomplished, and what can be accomplished. So thank you, Giselle, for having this program today. And thank you for all of the attendees. You're part of the solution. So now let me just do some brief reflections on Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We live and work in a time, as did Dr. King, when the U.S. healthcare system is in crisis. That crisis continues to be defined in terms of access, cost, and quality. And I'd like to add, for contemporary times, institutional behaviors based on medical economics access, cost, quality, and institutional behaviors. As we reflect on the power, and I emphasize the power of the voice that Dr. King brought to the moral consciousness of this nation, it is clear that his messages remain relevant to the work in front of us today. It was, it, I'm sorry. It wouldn't be Martin Luther King Day if I didn't share a few quotes, quotes that you're familiar with. Some are in your program. But before I start quoting him, let me just point out, and I want you to be able to relate to this. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was a young ma man, young. He was the same age as many of our medical students today, and certainly most of our medical residents. He was young. And think about the power of the voice, this young man brought to the issue, issues of equality. So let's start with just a few quotes that I'm sure you're very familiar with. One is the title of your program. I have a dream. And his quote is that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equally. A second quote that is, you often hear, and it's relevant. The arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And finally, one of the quotes you hear most often, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. But now I would like to add some quotes 
from in his voice that are relevant to what we do in medicine. And they provide a call to ac action for all of us. So let me just go through a few of them for you to relate to. First, the time is always right to do right. Second, make a career of humanity. Commit yourself to the noble struggle for equal rights. Third, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience, conscience asks the question, is it right? Next quote. I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals of a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and, and uh, freedom for their spirits. We have come a long, long way, but we have a long, long way to come. And now, finally, for that quote that is often related directly to medicine. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most inhumane. So as I close, I would briefly like to share a few lessons that I've learned that are modeled after the Reverend King style but a few lessons that I've learned and provide a charge for the futures that we will all be involved in. That starts today, by the way, the future does. The lessons. First, and you can tell this from the power of his quotes. First, words are important. The words you use are important. Second, overutilized words lose their power and impact. Third, especially for those who are involved in trying to make change. Third, it's not about what you say. It's about how you say it. It's not about what you say. It's about how you say it. And then finally, which is something I t spoke to the students about last night, the use of acronyms, the use of acronyms diminish the intent, the power, and the importance of the message that is uh, being delivered. So, I never say DEI. To me, it's always diversity, equity, and inclusion. And by the way, how many of you say CRM? Oh, how many of you know what CRM means? Oh, okay. That's the civil rights movement, okay? Would you demean the consequence and the progress that has been made in this country through the civil rights movement to an acronym? We can't do that for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So now, let me give you the charge. The American public values, respects, and trust its doctors. Not just because of what the doctors do, but because of who they are 
as moral guardians of human-centered care. So the charge to each of you, individually and collectively, is to accept ownership of the moral obligation to work towards achieving health e equality and health equity. To accept ownership and to accept that ownership, you don't have to do a lot. You can do this from where you are doing what you do every day. It's a moral obligation that you can accept and implement from where you are doing what you do every day. So thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful program. Thank you so much for that wonderful keynote uh, message. I, I will say that I am very inspired and will take the, especially about the acronyms, I will take that advice and apply that in my day to day. So thank you very much for that. So now we're gonna get into a fireside chat just for the format. I'll ask you a couple of questions and let you respond, but then we'll open it up for folks in the audience that have a few questions for um, Dr. Rossley. And I will say um, in the vein of having quotes, one of my favorite MLK quotes is, Power at its best is love implementing the demand of justice. And justice at its best is the power, is power correcting everything that stands against love. And when I think of that, I, I hear your, your message, I hear your call. And in this room, whether you're a student, whether you're a researcher, whether you're a practitioner, you have an element of power. And so when we think about how can we use our power to correct the injustices in our healthcare system, I guess my first question to you, and I guess it's the big <laughs> million dollar question, is as a medical school, as researchers, as practitioners, in this complicated problem that we have, where is a great place for us to start? How can we change and start to lead the charge as we go out and we work with patients and people and communities? I like the last part, as we work with patients and communities. We start, it, this is not trickle down. This is from the bottom up. And we start individually. We make our own individual personal commitment to equality uh, where, and, inequ uh, and to eradicating inequalities wherever we see it in any part of the, our lives. In any part, not just based upon some structure that we're in that allows us to have a voice. You have a voice. And it's, but remember, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's easy to let people know that you don't agree with behaviors. You don't have to say, I hate that. You just say, maybe there's a better way of doing it. That, so fundamentally, it starts with each individual. Each individual, if you do it, it starts to rise. Thank you, I, I really appreciate that. All of us taking our own personal responsibility to start the charge. And just to, sorry, I had a great time with her at breakfast, so I'm gonna have to bring y'all in on this one. <laughs> but we were talking about um, these, as individuals in these larger systems, and we're talking about how can we try to be impactful in a broken system. And I would love for you to share a little bit more about how as individuals we can come together to really work in these broken systems. One of the concepts that I attempted to introduce into the Health Policy Fellowship Program was that you, if you wanna solve a problem, you have to look at it from the high ground. And we have a healthcare system that is not structured or organized to, deli to deliver what we expect it to do. It just isn't. And our strategy has been to try and tweak it, to, 
to take out little pieces and make that better and then, and then stuff it back into this big system that doesn't work. It is time for us to look at the structure of the healthcare system. And I say system, and it really isn't a system. It's a loose collaboration of a whole bunch of businesses, all of whom have tried to figure out how to make money in healthcare. And who, and who suffers? The people, the people, okay? So fundamentally, we need to look at this picture differently from the high ground, okay? Because otherwise, we will be making minor changes in the system, incremental movements forever, and still not have achieved equality. Thank you. That's a, a really. I have to get off my pulpit. I'm sorry. My no, father, no. My grandfather was a Baptist minister. I'm sorry. So. I'm going to add a couple more levels because you keep, <laughs> keep on, keep keeping on. All right. All right. I love that. So when we think about these, these systems and we think about the ways that we can engage and we think specifically around the, like you said, the holistic aspect of our health. Like we talk about it as in we put this in the box of social determinants of health, but really it's just like how can we connect our systems to addressing those needs, to addressing the inhumane injustices that are impacting so many people's lives. If you had your way, unlimited resources, unlimited connections, collaborations, how would you reshape the system to be able to address those inhumane injustices that occur that impact health so negatively? First of all, I would introduce accountability into the system. If you are going to make the kind of money and profits in health care that are being made, then you're going to have to be accountable for the health of the population. Now, there. And once you start doing that, the system starts changing to accommodate it. It always helps to have somebody who's looking up at all of the uh, challenges to say, you got to change this too. But fundamentally, if you build accountability into the system, it will start to change. And there is no accountability for the population's health right now in our healthcare system. And let me say, again, it's not a system. It's a whole bunch of different groups, okay, that don't work together. But they all have their own motivation and incentives to stay engaged, particularly from a financial perspective. Now, those people in the audience, audience who have a master's degree in medical e economics, I'm sorry, I, I'm just a practitioner. My opinion is based and my perspective is based on my experience in the system, both as an administrator in education, but also as a patient in the system. It is bizarre, some of the things that are going, and it's not getting better, folks. It's not getting better. And government's engagement, government can, force the accountability, and they're just now starting with at least the control over pharmaceutical cost. Come on, you know? I, I use an eye drop, four drops a day, and each drop costs $20. Each drop, and there's no reason for it, except that somebody will pay for it, right? So it's time for us to understand that there's a motivation for why it's structured this way and build, a, and if they don't want to change the motivation, that's fine, but make them accountable for the health of the population. And that's the piece, that, that's the link that hasn't been formed. Thank you. I'll ask one more question, then I'll open it up to the group. So if you have your questions, please be prepared. But um, I guess the last one I really want to talk about is I, I really appreciate that, that change, that need for change and accountability, but what about buy-in? I know it's our moral imperative, but as you know, like when we add a financial incentive, sometimes moral imperatives, our need to do the right thing just falls by the wayside. So what would you, cons what would you suggest as a way to get people to buy in to this type of change, this over, complete overhauling of a healthcare system or the healthcare collaboration, if you would? People tend to behave according to what's in their interest. We tend to, however, compete, have competing interest, and that's part of the issue. Um, 
So what you have to do is provide or identify incentives that are appealing for people to go in the direction that you want them to go in, if that makes sense. And I, I don't mean to imply that it's easy, because it's not. But if you have accountability out there, it makes it easier to move in that direction, because you've got a yardstick that they are trying to meet, okay? What is their incentive, but they have to meet this, this yardstick? Thank you very much. Now I'm gonna to turn to the audience. I haven't been provocative enough if you, have, if you don't have a question. <laughs> and by the way, don't, uh, students don't have me come back there. Lee, thank you for being such an inspiration. I have a question about, just wanted to get your views on how technology is helping or being used now to address equity in healthcare. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you repeat it? Oh, uh, my question is about how technology is helping to address the issue of health equity especially within the our community. And um, I'm particularly interested in your views on sort of how artificial intelligence is coming into that conversation and that discussion and what you think sort of the future, uh, how the future looks with, with all that's coming uh, in the pipeline. Thank you. Actually, um, I had this discussion with some of the medical students uh, the other evening as well as some of the administrators who are in charge, and we've got some expertise in the audience, by the way. Um, technology and the use of AI is the new danger for healthcare quality. Mostly because of how the information for AI is acquired and how relevant it is to the reality of population health. So that plus the technology of feeding artificial intelligence with um, uh, information through technology, it creates a mountain that we need to be out in front of, not trying to change once it occurs. We need to be anticipating, we know enough to say that these are some challenges that will compromise patient care or population health based upon the data that's being used, the data that's being collected, and how it's being applied. It truly is, it's time for us to get our experts who are committed to equality get their heads together and get in front of this. Don't wait until you have to react to it. It's too late. It takes too long. Get in front of it. Be a part of the planning process because it is a resource and it is a tool that can benefit medicine, but not if we let it follow the same trends that we see right now in the healthcare system. Hello, thank you for all of your insight. Uh, could you talk about some of the parallel or interlocking systems to the medical system that create some of these disparate outcomes? Like, for example, our consumption culture. If you superimpose the consumption of high fructose corn syrup as a curve over the last 50 years with the curve of incidence in cancer, certain types of cancer, they almost match. So what about outside the medical system, but the culture that's consumerism, that fosters lack of sleep, that fosters bad chemicals in the body, you know, deserts in terms of good food, all those things that are actually potentially more fundamental towards bad health than the medical system itself that feeds on it. I just wanted to see if you could address that as well. Two things. We tend to refer to those in a group of the social determinants of health and food being one of those. Um, 
but I don't use the terms social determinants of health. I use the terms the social determinants of health vulnerability. We can correct for the vulnerability. But if you, you have to be careful that you don't present the issue and a problem that's too big to solve. Even as we talk about this big healthcare system that needs to be restructured, at the same time, don't build structures that make it difficult to solve. So I don't, I don't refer to as social determinants of health. It's social determinants of health vulnerability, which means these communities can be empowered, okay? They can be empowered. They're just vulnerable. They're not, you know, it's like poverty. Not everybody dies who is born in private poverty dies in poverty, okay? But you are more vulnerable. So it allows us a pathway to addressing the issues of food and, and, and education and things of that sort that are part of the cultural milieu, okay? Does that make sense? Did I answer it all? Okay. By the way, early on, when we were discussing wellness as well as health care, but wellness care, there was this major move to incorporate wellness care into the health care delivery system. Now, we just talked about the fact that this system is not structured to deliver anything effect uh, if it doesn't have a dollar sign connected to it. The same thing is true uh, when we talk about food, okay? Don't incorporate it into the healthcare system. D deal with it as a separate entity. Empower the communities that are vulnerable, okay? Don't have them go through a system that will collect some uh, financial revenue based upon it, okay? Word of caution. And, and that's a very interesting point. It comes to a, another question that I have where I think about vehicles, vehicles that are driving us towards our goal. Is there a place where maybe it's not within the healthcare collaboration, but a, like a, and not even a, a, a supplement, but just some, a separate way that we can move towards health? move towards equity that can't get caught up in these in this healthcare system? We don't currently have one, but folks, we can build it. We can build it. We can do this. And it's a kind of collaboration based upon the expertise that we already have that we can build a system that makes sense. And we don't have to sell it by, uh, by having it supported financially. We have the, re the resources us, not what's in our pockets, okay? The resources us, so we could do this. We, but it, we have to create that vision because there is no incentive for the current system to create that vision. We have to create that vision, and you have the expertise in this room to do it, and you have the commitment to equality in this room to do it. Hi, Dr. Rossi. I'm Kimberly Dawson. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is, Geisel has a strategic plan that's all about leading forward, and I wanted to know from your perspective, what are the hallmarks of a school that's on the cutting edge? Um, that's leading forward in today's healthcare environment and trying to address the problems we're trying to address. What would you look for in, um, to be a medical school to be working on or doing? I love it that you all are asking me these questions as though I have the answers. I don't, <laughs> but we'll, pre we'll pretend like I do, okay? <laughs> One of my perspectives in being in medicine and medical education for so long is that many medical schools are located in communities of need, but they are not a part of those communities. That, in fact, 
the people they most want to impress are other medical schools that have no connection to these communities. So my suggestion is that you hold medical schools and academic health centers accountable for the communities that they reside in, okay? So if you come to me, you better show me that where your school is is healthier than that place down the street that doesn't have one. And we can work together then to figure how to take what, how to share what it is you have with the place down the street that needs it. Does that make sense? Uh, truly, I want you to look around the country at all the medical schools, DO and MD. They're located in places and they're not delivering. Those, the communities that they reside in are not benefiting from having them there. And there's no excuse for that. You know. It's, um, it's interesting that you say that. We talk about accountability. Recently, there have been like these, um, you know, the, the school rankings. And then they added different measures around the amount of debt that students leave your school with, the amount of fin financial aid that they provide. And that was a, those were new measures for this last year. And certain schools really fell. And once you incorporated these equity measures, and I just imagine the uproar adding, <laughs> adding you know, population we, we, health we to have, medical school yeah, ranking. We don't have anybody, we don't have to ask anybody to do that. We can do that ourselves. Okay, t starting tomorrow, that's our project. Okay. Ooh, can that's I can project. I join? Can We're I join? Go, yeah, <laughs> I would love to join that. <laughs> folks, we have to stop waiting for somebody to do it for us. We can do it. We can do it. What it what it takes is vision and commitment. Okay? We can do that tomorrow. And we'll find and we'll we'll have a ranking of which school has the healthiest community, okay, based upon where they're located. Uh, and watch the dynamics start to change. You know, because we're nothing else in this country if not competitive. Okay. <laughs> Got it. All right. Hi, Dr. Rossley. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my mother-in-law is a big fan. She said to say hi to you. So I just wanted to pass that on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm staff uh, at the college, but I also serve medical students uh, and students at the other uh, institutions. And something that's been on my mind lately, and I'm really hoping to get your perspective, is that a lot of students and staff uh, across the university and at the medical school have come to me wondering how to talk about Palestine and about how they're afraid of getting censored in residency or having job repercussions when they leave Dartmouth or in other places. And it's something people have seen happen in other institutions. And sometimes I've had a lot of loss of words of what to say. So I'm just wondering if you have anything I can pass on from your years of experience. Thank you. Actually, I think that Reverend King gives us the way. It's, it's about humanity. It has nothing to do with skin color or religion or origin. It's about humanity. And I think the only way, and we've been tested and pushed to the point where we all now have to recognize, let's stop talking about diversity in terms of physical attributes. And let's start talking about diversity in respect to perspectives that we learn from each other, okay, and based on humanity. And that's the way you sell it. And it's not, by the way, it's not in context. That's not the word to use, okay? Got it. It's, it's, humani it's, it's humanity. It's human center, which is part of the mission we're having in Maryland. We want to deliver human-centered care, you know? Got it. It's scary to me to see that happen, you know? I, it, it's almost like I've lived in a very segregated society most of my life. I've been victim to all of the biases that you can think of both as a minority and as a, uh, as a female. Uh, and to think that now we will do it based on religions and uh, regions of the world that you come from, I can't, it, beyond me, it's so unacceptable that I refuse to accept it. So let's get back to a common commonality that brings us all together, and that's humanity. We are human beings. That's a 
tough one to follow. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Rossley. My name is Alice Neely. I'm with the Public Health Council of the Upper Valley. Uh, we're serving a, a broad community here on both sides of the river. Um, I, I want to go back to something you, you said a little while ago about um, the system, the, the health care system does have a, a lot of flaws. And um, I'm, I agree with you, it's not going to get any better as long as health equity firms continue to buy health care and as long as um, we can see, continue to see consolidation. I, I was brought into public health with the, the philosophy that the system will not solve our, our public health issues. It has to be the community way. And so I, I would like to offer the notion that um, it's not about building systems in the community that, that bring people together to solve problems. It's about asking the community what we need to do to help them solve the problems that they see in the way that works for them. It, it's not going to be huge. It's not going to be system nationwide all at once. But we, to, you, to your point about we all have it in us to do something. I think we all, and, and I beg of medical students, as you go out into the world and become a full-fledged doctor and have that weight of respectability and integrity and, and influence, please recognize that you need to ask your patients what communities they're part of and how those communities su sustain them and what can be done to help support those communities. I've had the privilege over the last couple of years to work with a lot of people in our community who are um, part of marginalized groups here and they know what they need to do and they just need to be given the space and the support to do it and I've been privileged to be able to serve them. It's the community way that's going to really begin to create change and I think that's what will create the groundswell to say this system is not serving us anymore. It must change. Thank you. With one small exception. What you've done is you've divided communities and their needs away from the, st the structure that's designed to handle those same needs. And that's always dangerous. And that's especially dangerous in minority and marginalized communities, okay? Because they, through systemic biases will not have the same resources to be able to bring to bear on those communities. This is the model of a flawed system that we work in, that we've allowed to exist. It makes sense, you know, and don't expect the hospital or the academic health center to solve the community's problems, right. But they're all, both, are symptoms of the structural problem that exists. So let's address the structural problem before we, be, which is what I was referring to. We keep, we keep trying to, to solve the impact, okay? But you're gonna keep getting that impact if you're structured to produce that impact. And that's what we're dealing with right now, okay? And have been dealing with for a long time. And it's the hardest thing in the world to address because our, our academic centers, our, our, our educational centers are structured in the same way. We're all a part and we've been incorporated into the problem. So it takes a real push like the power of Reverend King's words to get above that to be able to see where the real problem is, okay? to be able to have a vision as to how we can help those communities and at the same time change those health systems that should be engaged. Because to, to try and change or to a, work specifically with the community without the health system, it's, it's, there's no long-term survival to that, okay? That ultimately they've gotta be together, okay? But 
Well, but we can embarrass the health system along the way. That, that, that always helps. So we use those things that people respond to, right? Okay. Okay. You can say that, qu you can see that question brought me out of my seat, right? <laughs> Hello, Dr. Ross. Hi, Dr. Ross. I am both a student and a staff member, and as I was listening to your keynote and the mission that you charged us with, um, and also just you talking about some of the structural issues, I couldn't help but think um, about your time and your experience in the field. And you said that it starts with us as individuals, but there's also a community aspect. And my concern is, what do we do to build up the endurance that it takes to address these issues? as individuals, to build up the endurance that it takes to address these issues as individuals and a community? Well, we do, we, in all honesty, we probably don't have the endurance because it takes time, okay? Which means that we have to recognize, each, each generation has to recognize the power resolve in the younger generations that are coming, falling behind us. Those are the generations that ca carry the torch forward, okay? So, yeah. It's for what needs to be done, we truly have to engage and operationalize medical students, which means we have to stop treating and thinking the, of them as children. They're not. They live in the same world that we live in. And and in all honesty, they're more, much more technologically savvy than we are, okay? And that's, that's the new hill, okay? Nothing we do is going to change anything permanently. We can tweak it, but we're not going to, unless, unless we have that army of, of students behind us. And I don't just mean medical students. I mean students in K-12. We got to do better. And by the way, when you talk about community, what's, you know, I grew up poor, really poor. What saved me was public education. I want you all to just take a moment to look at what's happening to public education. It is horrendous. And if we allow education to fail, it's over. That's the pipeline. That's the pipeline to health care. That's the pipeline to everything we do from a perspective of equality. Okay? So, did I give you a big enough charge? <laughs> Got it. All right, and we'll have our last question from the front. So I had the pleasure last night of coming up on the same flight with Dr. Rossley, um, our delayed and bumpy flight, I should say. So as we were delayed and sitting in National Airport in D.C., we had a wonderful conversation about our children and our grandchildren. And then we got to talk about this new school that Dr. Wasley is starting, a new osteopathic school. And I just wanted to know, and I noticed it wasn't in your bio, so I wanted to mention it. Um, I just wanted to ask you how, you, you know, you have such a wonderful vision that you've been talking about. I just wanted to see how you're able to incorporate your vision into this new school. And what's going to set it apart from other osteopathic schools around the country? How you're going to make it different? Well, you know, as I spoke to the students the, the other evening, I have the look. Well, what you have to learn how to do is take advantage of those opportunities that are, that are out there to get you to where you want to go. That makes sense? Starting a new school is an amazing opportunity to do things better and differently from what they're being done now. Now, and to, now I think I have all the answers, but in all honesty, folks, I'll confess I don't. Mm -hmm. but, but in order to do that, we need to be engaged, be able to engage more minds than mine, right? And so we're talking about one of the things we're talking about starting at this new Mer uh, medical school in Maryland is a new category of faculty. And we want to call them visiting academic scholars. And they will have formal appointments. But we don't have to hire them. We, they get to provide us their voice on issues as they feel motivated. 
we get to pick and choose and say, hey, we need an expert on, who is it over here, a AI, okay, that has this perspective and be able to include, and not just live the, the academic structure that we've always lived. We don't have to do that anymore. The issues are too big and they're moving too fast, okay? So what we're going to do is Everybody, uh, when the message got out that we were opening this medical school in collaboration with Morgan State University, which is an H, uh, historically based college. <laughs> now, you know, for me, it was important. Important enough to delay retirement, but it was important. <laughs> but what I didn't realize, I can't tell you. Get, to this day, I get calls from all over the country and the world saying, what can we do to help? So this new category, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna bring those names and those people and those disciplines together. We're gonna keep them looped, uh, looped into what's going on. And, we, and as they want to be involved, and as we need to have involvement, we already have them on board, you know? So that's what we, and that's, a real break in tradition, by the way, of the way fact. It doesn't mean we're still going to have full time faculty. We're still going to have adjunct clinical faculty. We're going to have all that. But we're going to have this extra layer of expertise that we couldn't, uh, we couldn't buy. Okay? But that are committed to, to the idea, to the concept. And that's even better than having a full time employee. I want you all to know that. I, I say that from experience. <laughs> okay. okay. So anybody that wants to be involved, make sure you get, I get your name, okay? Because <laughs> you will hear from me. I, and it doesn't mean you, you, you're committing to do anything. You're committing to knowing what we're doing so if you want to do something, you can. Got it? Okay. Let's give Dr. Barbara Ross Lee another hand. Thank you so much. Dr. Akray, thank you for your MC. you the best in America. Uh, a program of this magnitude obviously takes a lot of hands, a lot of collectiveness. So I want to thank the members of the DICE team, Jerome, Myra, Faroach, Sean, Wendy, O'Leary, and everyone in that office. Also our alumni relations team, you're the best. It's always a pleasure to work with you. I want to recognize my colleague from the Institute of Diversity Equity, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Delalu. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for supporting me always. Thank you to Genentech. Thank you for your support. I got 42 day of challenge that I'm appreciative to you for allowing me to focus in on with all of you in this room on addressing what King said in 1968 is we need to eradicate food insecurity and poverty, and we're gonna be doing some things. Again, if you wanna attend the poverty simulation, which is not a game, by the way. It is based in applied on trauma-informed care, and also it changes, as we see throughout graduate medical education. So many medical schools and corporations have incorporated this into their curriculum. So, uh, as I said at the student government meeting, uh, next month, Harvard would have a whole feature on this simulation. So uh, I wanted to bring it to Geisel first because you know we're number one. So <laughs> that's just my bias. So I want to thank you. Let's give another hand to our awardees. I see you. I see you. I see you. And if you know someone next year, we got a year, you know the categories. We're gonna open it up 45 days earlier this year. The nominating committee had such a tough com uh, uh, choice in the many applic uh, nomination applications. Those folks in your programs, I wanna acknowledge the finalists. Uh, you are also, uh, should be acknowledged for your service to the Geisel DH community. So thank you, but I want you to start thinking about next year. I want you to think about already next year who in our community believes that they're invisible. We see you, we appreciate you, and we're so thankful for you. So uh, we're gonna conclude now, Jerome, is that right?
Yes, but I would like to get all the awardees up front oh, yeah. so we can get a group shot with Dr. Barbara Ross Lee. Dean Compton, is, are you in the room? Do you want to come up, sir, so we can get you in the shot? Dr. Delaware, would you like to join us? Thank you. Dr. Malcolm. As Dr. McBride said, thank you all for coming. Please, if there's anything extra outside, please feel free to take something with you. We're just going to have a moment with the awardees and get some shots, come up and say congratulations and all those wonderful things. We look forward to seeing you and other things that we have coming up this year.